I don't know if you know this, but I have this weird thing where I bump into celebrities and I act like I know them. It's something I've done. Uh, probably my favorite moment was Mel Gibson when I saw, I was told he had just been at a restaurant we were at and so I chased him down because nothing says stalk or tase me like that. And I remember I ran up to him, I was super out of breath. I was like, <sighs> and he looked at me with those beautiful blue eyes. Mel has such nice eyes and, and, and kind of wild and he looks crazy. Um, not in a mean way, but, but he looks like he could do you damage. And, and I said to him, did you want to get a picture with me today? And, uh, and he just put his hand on my shoulder. I was like, oh, he's touching me. He's like, not today. Room and pushed me away. And I was like, awesome. Yeah. It didn't even matter. Like, I was so happy. And, um, and here's the thing. Uh, we all have a fight or flight within us. Uh, some of us run towards things, others uh, pull back, and, um, and there's a little more reserved. And, and it happens in the animal kingdom. You see a dog who um, has a stranger approaching them, or a stranger walks by, and they'll either cower or bare their teeth. There's a, there's a flight response of like pulling back. But um, if that dog knows you, if that dog knows you, and you approach him, they're like, well, hello, and their whole body wags like, it's so good to see you. Did you know we're in love? And like, want to be near you, right? There's this, this sweetness, and I think, like, I think we are so the same. If you flip the script, and I leave a restaurant, and Mel Gibson comes up and is like, hey, Eric, I was wondering, do you want a picture with me today? I'd be like, I do. It's amazing, right? I'd be kind of like, I'd be like that dog. I'd be like, this is amazing. Mel Gibson wants a picture with me. But, but the reality is this. If we know a person in power or someone of influence and we see them and we trust them and, and we have an, an affection or an affinity for them and we believe they want to know us, we will approach them like that, that sweet dog of like, like, oh my gosh, and we'll come up and just kind of, well, in approaching greatness, we'll do so quite boldly. And I think that is something we want to look at today, to let the text we've been working through this week define for us approaching greatness. Let it define that for us, because as we approach God, there should be um, a boldness in it, and I think we should talk about why. So to do that, what I want to do is frame where we're at. Remember, we are doing a biblical overview. I think it's 19 months long. It's going from January 1 of this year to August of 2023. We are working our way through the, the Kings. Matt did a great job talking about Kings and the kind of the sourcing of that book and then Chronicles and these things. We're working our way through that and we're going to engage with some people today, uh, really three characters. We'll talk about them in a moment. But where we're at right now, historically, on the timeline of Israel, is you have this moment where the timeline is kind of singular, right? Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then it hits this moment where um, there's a fork in the road, and it's Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, ruling the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and then Jeroboam becomes king over the northern tribes, um, and north is always top, so I'm going to do this. So the north, I'm dyslexic. So the northern tribes, uh, Re Jeroboam is king over. And um, from 900 BC, that's where we really are. Uh, so 900 years before Christ was born, from 900 BC to uh, about 874, we see a slew of kings come through in the northern kingdom. There's a bunch of them. There's Nadab, Basha, Eliah, Zimri, um, Tibni. Omri, and then there's this dude named Ahab. Ahab, he is not a good king. We get a picture of him here. And here's the thing with Ahab. I don't think Ahab was a good leader, personally. He had a long rule. I think he ruled for more than 20 years, but here's the thing. I think the force behind him was his wife, Jezebel. And Jezebel was a piece of work. I mean, this woman did damage to the people of Israel. And, um, and Israel, um, under the rule of Ahab, became a wasteland of sorts, both emotionally spiritually and physically. Um, I don't know, has anybody here ever seen The Lion King? Yeah, I love The Lion King. And um, when Scar takes over, the, if you've never seen The Lion King, you're like, what's going on right here? Just if you've never seen The Lion King, 
I need to talk with you actually and give you, I'll give you a VHS so you can see it in its original format. Um, but uh, in The Lion King, uh, Scar, the, the mean brother, kills Mufasa who ruled the, the pride lands of the lions and um, and Scar takes over, he brings in the hyenas, and this once lush, beautiful, abundant, full of life land was laid waste. And it's empty, and it's dry, and it's burned up, and there's no food. And I, I always think to myself, Ahab and Jezebel were like Scar and the hyenas. They ruin the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. They just lay waste to it. And Ahab was, um, he was an apostate. He worshiped other gods freely, joyfully, and he hated God. Jezebel, um, I think he did so very much at the, at the uh, prompting of his wife. She was a woman who despised the law of God and she despised um, the God of Israel and she brought in every just evil, wicked practice known, brought it into Israel and turned the northern kingdom fully away from God. So you have this season of, of decline, uh, of Jeroboam declining through these kings into further apostasy and sin till you get to kind of the benchmark of evil, which is Ahab and Jezebel. And when we get there, there is this moment where the overall state of Israel is just a wreck. It's a wreck. And God sends into the story Two, um, two prophets. The first one, and I love the picture we have him is Elijah. Elijah is, look at that. You want to mess with that, dude? That is a man's beard right there. That is great. It's like he's a dwarf from Lord of the Rings. He's just really tough looking. But Elijah is a prophet of God, and he loves the Lord. And, um, and what we know about Elijah is that um, he is someone who, who served God faithfully all the days of his life. Um, you read stories this week in your devotions, like the widow and her son. You read about Ahab and Jezebel and the confrontation between them and uh, Elijah. You read about Elijah hiding in a cave and um, getting to see and, and hear those stories and be reminded of the greatness of Elijah. But he had a guy who was his, he mentored and, and kind of came behind him. And their names are so similar. I can't judge it because I'm married to Erica. What up, girl? Um, yeah, I did that. That was good. I'm going to keep that. Um, but but <laughs> I totally lost my train of thought. Stick with me. So you have Elijah. And, um, and the way I kind of remember the order they go in, Elijah and Elisha, is J in the alphabet comes before S. It's E-L-I-J or E-L-I-S. So Elijah comes first, then Elisha. And um, Elisha was a prophet who um, succeeded after, um, or succeeded and followed Elijah. And God told Elijah that Elisha would follow him and when Elijah was to anoint him. And so there's a story that um, we'll unpack later. But these two prophets worked together and they were faithful to God. And one of the things that, that gets me about them is they were so bold. And I wonder to myself, how were they so bold? In, in, a, in a time of great evil and wickedness in the kingdom of Israel, where the country is being run by evil, malevolent people who have chosen to hate God, they stood up and with full-throated disgust and honesty declared the word of the Lord over those rulers. And they did it so boldly. And I love that. When God sent Elijah into situations, he responded faithfully. And he was so bold in the cause. Culture. And I think one of the things that blows my mind is even in the boldness, there was a boldness that he had, not just to speak to culture, but a boldness with God. They approached God in a, um, in a bold way, not commanding God, but asking clearly of God what they wanted in um, in this last week's devotion, you read the story of the widow and her son. And the widow and her son is a story when God sends Elijah to this woman's house and he is supposed to ask her for food. And he goes up to her and she's gathering sticks and he, and he says, will you make me some bread, get me a drink and then make me a little bread. And she says, I'm paraphrasing, look man, I'm, I'm gathering sticks to bake the last meal for my son and I. I have a little flour, a little oil, and then we're gonna die. There's a famine, it's been horrible. And Elijah says, only first, Give me some water and bread, and you will not run out. And all the years of that famine, the flour 
And the oil in her pots never ran out. And she survived in this. And they get through the famine. The rains return. The land is fertile again. What happens? Her son gets sick and dies. Her son gets sick and dies. And Elijah is there and he's witnessing this. I want you to join me in 1 Kings 17, 19 to 23, when Elijah boldly goes to God with this. He says this to the woman who is sitting there with her son who is dead. And he says, give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying. So he was living above their house in an upper room and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to God. And it wasn't this woeful cry. Listen to the clarity of his words. Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? He goes to the source of life and he's like, God, is this what's happening? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord. Lord, my God, let this, life, this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked the child up. Now notice, he's alive again. He could have taken him by the hand, but he didn't. He scoops him up and he carries him down to the room and to the house and he gives him to his mother and he says to her, look, your son is alive. There's other boldnesses in the story of Elijah. When he, it is like, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where it's like the odds aren't in your favor, not Hunger Games wise, but um, like maybe there's, maybe you're, you're facing something, uh, maybe like in sports where it's you versus, you know, a couple linebackers and you're like, I'm in a lot of trouble and they maul you. Elijah went one versus 400 with the prophets of Baal on a mountaintop. The entire kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel was with Ahab and Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. And they were going to do a sacrifice and so was Elijah. And Elijah, he taunted them. 400 to 1 odds taunted them. They did all their thing. Nothing happened. Elijah was so bold with God that he took his sacrifice, built his altar, drenched it with water. And if you know anything about fire, puts, you know, like... It, water kills it and he everything's soaking wet and he drenches it and then he calls on God and God consumes the sacrifice and Elijah is seen as a faithful and true prophet and he does this and people are awestruck at what he does it's an amazing moment of um of just boldness he calls on God to show himself to the people of Israel versus this false god Baal and Elisha he was super bold as well he was amazing in the way that he approached because he loved Elijah. He was devoted to Elijah. He wanted to follow him and be near him. He wanted to learn from him, but he also wanted um, not only walking in his footsteps, but he wanted to exceed even the work of Elijah. And we find in 2 Kings 2, 7 to 14, one of my very favorite passages of scripture. I don't know why this one lives in me and we can't go into it in the angle I usually do, but I want to go into it and look at it. I'm going to tell the story a little more than read it, but the the it's on the screen there and it says this 50 men of the company of prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha stopped at the Jordan now pick the story up here they're facing Elijah and Elisha Elijah rolls up his cloak and whop slaps the Jordan River and it parts and they walk across on dry ground and the company of prophets had to be like oh you know, it's a pretty amazing moment. They walk across and it says, then they go on and the two men are walking and talking together. And Elijah asks a question, what is it you want from me? What can I do for you? And get the boldness of Elisha. He says to his mentor, I want twice what you had. I want double portion of your spirit. I want that. And Elijah, knowing it's not his to give, says to him, his, his flat out reply is that, that um, that's not something he can give, but if he sees when God takes him away, if you see me depart, then it will be done for you. At that moment, as they walked and talked, it says a whirlwind of fire came down, separated the two men. Then chariots of fire came in, and Elisha cries out, my father, my father, the horsemen of Israel. Elijah is taken up in the chariots and taken into heaven. He never died super interesting to me. He never died and he goes up into heaven and Elisha picks up the cloak of his former mentor and he roll, walks out back to the Jordan River, rolls it up, whop, smacks the river and says, where now is the God of Israel? 
The waters part, and he walks across on dry land. I don't want to deal so much with the question he asks as the boldness with which he acted, because Elijah, Elisha did indeed receive a double portion, and it is seen in all the the miracles of Elijah, Elisha did exactly double that except for one during his lifetime. He was one short, which would be disappointing. But there's a story in scripture where a dead man is laid on the bones of Elisha and the dude pops up and leaves the tomb. And everybody's like, oh, and there's his final miracle. And Elisha did double the miracles, even in death, that Elijah did in his lifetime. So he boldly approached that. And you can read that in devotion on day 91 of this past week. But um, the question is, we beg it, how were they so bold? How were they so bold? Well, I think the answer comes in a, a pretty simple response. They knew the one who was on the throne that they approached. If I had to approach a throne with a king sitting on it, and I didn't know that king, I would be terrified, not because I think they're going to hurt me, but because I may break protocol, I may do something uncouth or unacceptable in their culture, I may offend and not trying to, but still offend them. So I would be a little nervous, right? I'd be nervous. But if I was walking up to a throne, and let's just say, of course, I'll use this, my son Ethan is sitting on it, to which he's like, yeah, I am. And uh, I'm walking up, I know the person on the throne. I am not going to be as worried about protocols. I'm not going to be worried about, I know the person on the throne and there'll be a comfort there. Um, Here's how we know that they were bold. Here's how we know the source of their boldness. In, um, In the story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, we find Elijah at a moment where he is hiding in a cave. He's exhausted. He is broken. He is weary. And God does something in this um, that I think is powerful and reminiscent um, for us, not reminiscent, but something for us to remember and hold in our hearts of who God is. I'm going to tell you this story more than read it, but you can follow along on the screen or in your own Bible. It comes out of 1 Kings um, chapter 19, 11 to th- uh, 13. It says this, God told Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, You should be like, oh my gosh, when did this happen before? Moses, but we're not dealing with that. But this is an echo, right? And he goes out and it says this. At that point, when he goes out, there was a great earthquake when the Lord said, or a great wind came when the Lord said this. And it tore the mountains and split the rocks, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. Then there was a great earthquake and it shook the foundations of the mountain, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. Then there was a great fire but the Lord wasn't in the fire. Then there was a gentle whisper. There was a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard the gentle whisper, he pulled the cloak over his face to shield his face, and he walked to the mouth of the cave. And a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Where did he find God? See, we we always want to put God in a place of terror, Fear and terror are different things. Respect and awe are different than abject terror. He goes through these terrifying moments of earthquake, wind, fire, all these things. But but when the gentle whisper comes, he knows that's God. He knows that gentle whisper is the voice of God. And I think for you and I, when we live in a faith or a religious contra- construct that puts our idea of God in a frame that has him mean, malevolent, unkind, unforgiving. We are afraid of him. When we only know other people's experiences and we don't know God for ourselves, we fear him and we approach with great trepidation and fear. But when we know him, we know he's the God who is found in the gentle whisper. He's not the God who's going to come and, and literally force you to believe by revealing himself in totality to you. He is going to call you by faith to believe in him. It'll be a gentle whisper. It'll be an approachable thing. And we are to know God. And here's why it's important. When Elijah, heard, when Elijah heard the gentle whisper, he responded to the voice he knew. He knew that voice. And he had heard the Spirit of God before. So we can look at that and know for ourselves that we as people 
live in the age of revelation in that Jesus Christ has come, lived, died, rose again, and we are redeemed by his blood. And so we should know him, our church, the call of our church, the mission of our church, to know God is the first thing, to know him. Why? Because when you know him, you will inadvertently make him known. You won't even try and it'll happen. Because in knowing God, it's, it's completely transformative. And that's what we see in Elijah. Because we look at this story and we understand that God, the God of a gentle whisper, is also, um, is also calling to us. And we get to respond because we know the sacrifice of Jesus has removed our sin and his righteousness, his holiness is given to us like a garment to wear. When God looks on you, he doesn't see all your sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ if you are in Christ. We know that and we know that um, when God sees us that way, we we can approach with boldness because he loves you. I want to do two quick theological points that I think are absolutely mission critical. There is no one, no one period that God doesn't love. No one. I think it's in Lamentations 3 where it says that God does not want any one who is evil to die because he knows that apart from this life, when they die, they are apart from him in eternity. God doesn't want that. There's no one that God doesn't love. So what it means for, the, for you is God has always loved you. God's desire is for you to be in relationship with you. So that's theological point one, right? A truth of God you can stake everything on. God loves you and always has loved you. The second thing, the truth is this. Sin is the one thing that separates you from God. And I don't care if it's a little white lie or sin as great as Jezebel and Ahab. Your sin is the thing that separates you from God. And when we live in willful, unrepentant sin, we live apart by choice from God. Since we know that Jesus paid the price for our sins, we can go to him. And it says in scripture that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our iniquity. We are forgiven of our sin. He has always desired that we, his people, would be in relationship with him. And you may think, okay, Eric, how does that work? So, so what does that mean that he's always loved me? What does it mean that he knew I was broken and I had a and sin had kind of mangled my nature? Here's, here's what it means when I, I've told you, I love Psalm 139. I love, I love the meaning, I love the depth and the theology and the richness. When God's spirit prompted David to write it, I love what it says and I want to read to you the first 24 verses of that chapter and look at it together and just take a moment and recognize the gentle whisper of God, the goodness of God, the fact that we are invited to know God as much as he has known us. It says this, Psalm 139, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts when they are far away. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. I, oh man. I just love that. You are familiar with, he knows our habits. He knows our eccentricities. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. And such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed down in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of dawn and I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become noon, or the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would be outnumber the grains of sand. 
When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me. You who are bloodthirsty, they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? And I abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any sinful, wicked way in me and lead me in a way of everlasting. When we look at that scripture, we need to realize that is how we are loved. We are not loved like, like someone who maybe like first date love, you know, you meet someone, you're like, oh, I like them so much. And they're perfect and they really tried hard. We are like stomach flu loved. We are loved when we're at our worst, when we're falling apart. God knows us. And I love that you are familiar with all my ways before I get up and go out. You already, you already knew I was going to before I say a word. You already knew the words that were going to come from my mouth. God knows us completely, and yet his word is what? I love you. I made you. I'm calling you back to myself to be in relationship with me. That is how you are loved. And you are loved by the one who sits on the throne. You are loved like that by the one who sits on the throne. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we as individuals and as a corporate church are invited to boldly approach the throne of God and to ask according to his will whatever is heavy on our hearts and lay before him with boldness, the boldness of a child looking for a snack from a parent, aunt, grandma, someone who loves you, going up and being like, can I have a cosmic brownie? And like asking for that. We, we get to go to God. And no, not all our desires get met. But the reality is we can boldly approach and we are not slapped away and mistreated. We are loved by the eternal father, the creator and sustainer of all things. And if you wonder what is the measure of God's love, it is the sending of his very son, the sending of his son to die for us, to rise again. And then what did he do? He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and illuminate for us a life that is being transformed into the image of Christ. What the Father loves most is his Son, and he is remaking us into his image. There's no greater measurement of the love of God than that. He created you, he loves you, and he's calling you back to, your, to himself. How will you respond to such hope? Lord Jesus Christ, we as your church give you thanks and praise for who you are. We humble ourselves right now and just admit it is beyond us that we would be able to even hear this, but it is true. And so we receive your love in full measure into our life and we ask God, would you help us who are so self-centered and so selfish to get beyond ourselves and see you, to see you, the God of the universe, and in humble like adoration fall before you to love you and to worship you and live a life worthy of the gift of our salvation. Thank you for such a gift. Thank you for redemption. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.